Well, good morning, uh, folks and witnesses on on Zoom. Uh, it is Thursday morning, April seventh, and we're going to have a conversation with some diversified uh, agricultural producers uh, this morning um, and trying to uh, hear what their issues are uh, and uh, how things are going with their particular uh, operation and if there's anything that we might be able to do to assist them. <laughs> Pardon me. And uh, another issue that I don't know if any of the witnesses have, have uh, been in the natural resources or heard from them in regards to testifying on uh, H-466, which is a surface water bill um, that uh, if you draw water from a stream or, or um, to take care of your plants uh, uh, about reporting on that uh, and keeping track of the amount you're using. So uh, we, we've got, uh, we have four witnesses scheduled and uh, I believe Hannah's with us uh, and um, Chuck Worcester. And uh, so uh, good morning, Hannah. And uh, maybe you could <clears throat> tell us a little about your operation and where you're located. And, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, ask questions maybe at the end or as you're going through, but it's kind of a, we run kind of a loose committee and try to make everybody feel like it's a round table discussion if at all possible. Uh, so um, hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll operate in the same manner. So welcome and uh, good morning. Thank you very much and thanks for your time this morning. Um, my name is Hannah Doyle. I own and operate Boneyard Farm in Fletcher, Vermont. We're right on the Franklin County, Lamoille County line, um, literally on the town line. And uh, I raise non-GMO pastured eggs, chicken, pork, and lamb eventually. Um, I have breeding ewes right now that will be a flock of sheep uh, eventually breeding. and we hope to sell lamb and wool at our farm stand and farmer's market. Um, I also grow vegetables and cut flowers and herbs, and I make a line of value-added products, um, mostly canned goods like jam and pickles and chutney. So um, I do a little of everything, and uh, I think that's sort of what you want to talk about today. And I'm definitely interested to hear questions because I'm not sure exactly what, uh, how I can advise, you know, or what, what you're looking to know. Um, but I'm happy to tell you a little bit about where we are at. We just purchased a 180 acre, formerly conventional dairy last year, about a year ago. Um, and we are sort of rehabbing it into a diversified operation. So we're at the very beginning of a, a startup phase here on our property. We've been farming for um, five years or so, uh, but, but now at a much larger scale. My husband also owns a construction business. So we have two small businesses and two small kids, and uh, we are, <laughs> we are, Definitely overwhelmed with all of the work and the potential, um, but we've been met with a lot of support and demand from our local community. So we feel really grateful for the opportunity to be producing food and uh, hopefully stewarding this land in a way that um, improves environmental conditions and provides a good life for our animals and our family. So uh, right now, you know, just this spring we are renovating that that former dairy barn into a multi-use facility. So we're jackhammering out curbs and removing stanchions and putting in a walk-in cooler. 
uh, last year we built a farm stand into the front of the dairy barn so the big sliding door opens to the public and on weekends people can come and get a, a wide variety of food from our farm stand. Uh, so we're, you know, we're building perimeter fencing, we're constructing greenhouses, we are building mobile hen houses so that our laying hens can be pastured and rotationally grazed. Um, we're, we're really just establishing lots of systems right now. Um, and it's a really exhausting phase to be in, but it's also very exciting. Uh, and, you know, I think because we have so many small enterprises, we often don't feel like, like we fit as farmers. Um, you know, like where we were in Bakersfield prior, people would see me at the farmer's market and say, oh, I didn't know there was a farm on, on Witchcat Road because they don't see Holsteins and they don't see a tractor and they don't see a big barn. And now we have the big barn and we have the road frontage, but I still don't own a tractor. Um, you know, I do most of the vegetable work by hand and it's all drip irrigation. I don't have employees. I'm, I'm a very small farmer with many different enterprises. So, you know, I'm moving pastured fences for my sheep every day and I'm out there collecting eggs and washing them by hand. And I don't always feel like I look like a farmer to the typical um, Vermont consumer maybe. So I think one of the things I wanted to just address is, is maybe that, that sort of public education about what diversified farming looks like in Vermont. I think especially as we kind of shift toward a, a model that maybe includes more diversified agriculture in Vermont. And, you know, it's in our agricultural history. There used to be hill farms all over the state that produced a little of this and a little of that for their immediate communities. And to me, it seems like we are going back in that direction a little bit, and I'm proud to be part of that change. Um, but I think, you know, just, just the fact that diversified farming is farming and a farmer might look different in 2022 than 1980. Um, that's, that's an important component, I think. Um, I also would say that affordable healthcare and affordable childcare would go a long way uh, to help all farmers, um, myself included, here with two little kids and trying to kind of do it all seven days a week. Um, we're definitely feeling the pressure of that and we're self-employed, so health insurance is very difficult. Uh, but you know, I think I think a lot of technical support exists, and I feel grateful to be farming in Vermont. There are so many resources available to us. We're still just sort of sorting through them all, honestly, and and saying, you know, okay, if it's almost like um, it's almost like a flowchart is needed. You know, okay, if you want to do this, you talk to NRCS, and if you want to do this, you talk to UVM Extension, and there there are this there are these resources and here's how you access them. So we're, you know, we're very grateful for all of the resources that do exist and all of the funding opportunities that do exist. We're just really in this unique, not unique, but um, pivotal uh, starting point for our farm business. Um, and, and then I think another thing that we've noticed, I've noticed is there seems to be a lot of funding for larger farms that have an environmental problem already um, and not a lot of funding for farms who are starting out and implement designing and implementing infrastructure systems. So, you know, just as an example, um, I reached out and, and talked to the pasture and surface water fencing program about perimeter fencing and a main line of water for our rotationally grazed sheep. And they said, the cutoff is 15 sheep and you have 13, you know? So we're like not quite big enough to access those, those pools of money in lots of cases. And we also, <clears throat> because we're new on this property, we don't have water quality concerns yet. You know, our livestock are not grazing in a stream. So we don't need to fence them out. We don't have manure management problems because we're small and starting up, but we want to set off on the right path and uh, design systems that are going to work for the environment and for our farm business from the get-go. Uh, so, Heather, 
What was the deal on the fencing? You were too small. What was that? Could you repeat that again? Sure, it's Hannah. Um, I I reached out to the UVM and um, I think Department of Ag. It, there's a program called Pasture and Surface Water Fencing. And so they, they help you to establish perimeter fencing if needed and uh, sometimes run water to animals. So, you know, I was, I was interested in some funding to help us build a perimeter fence for our sheep pasture and lay out a, a black pipe basically to bring hoses to our sheep so that when we're moving them daily or every three days or so, we're not dragging hoses all over the farm. Uh, and, and they told me that they're happy to talk about it and we might be able to work something out but for right now, the cutoff is 15 sheep and I have 13. So that, that's just you know, a small anecdote to sort of illustrate that, that sometimes we're not quite, because we have many different things, you know, I've, got, I've got 13 sheep, but I've got two pregnant sows right now. So they'll have piglets soon, but I don't quite qualify for this. And you know, I've, I've got laying hens that are on pasture, but sometimes the bureaucracy doesn't really see laying hens as grazing stock. So it doesn't count if I'm applying for rotational grazing programs and things like that. Just, you know, just diversified agriculture sometimes can, by its nature, put you in a tricky position. Did you check with ASCS on the fencing? Because they have a fencing program as well, I believe. And that's your, you know, your county, uh, USDA, um, your county uh, organization. Yeah, are you thinking of an EQIP program through NRCS? No, it's, it's through the USDA, your agricultural services organization within your county. It's a federal issue, a federal program. And uh, they, they may have, I know they have a fencing program, uh, especially for perimeter fence. And uh, so you may want to check with them in regards to to the, you know what they what they give and and what you have to do to qualify. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I, I wrote that down and I'll I'll look into it. I that's a great example of me just not knowing what opportunities exist. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we feel pretty strongly that it's not necessarily government's role to uh, fund our business. You know, it's a it's a business, and so we tend to cash flow things ourselves and build the fence ourselves, um, build the greenhouse ourselves, you know? So yeah, I'm not, I, I'm, you know, personally just not sure what the role of government in a business like farming is. So happy to be part of this conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. If, I, if I might just say one thing, uh, this is the second time I've testified to this committee this year. And the second time I've been listed as a co-owner of my farm, while all of my male counterparts are listed as owners. And it is likely just a clerical issue. Um, if so, we can absolutely correct that. But I just, you know, my husband and I own this land together, but Boneyard Farm is a single member LLC owned by me. And I wonder how many of my male counterparts are co-owners, in fact. Um, so I think, you know, it might just be worth mentioning to consider the role of women in agriculture. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that must be a clerical issue that our, our clerk, uh, you know, just thought being in two names, it was both, but we'll, uh, we'll get that squared away for you. Uh, and uh, Chris had a question, I believe. Senator Pearson? Yeah, um, thank you, Hannah. And, and I, I was the person that passed your name along. I think it came to me from uh, NOFA that way as co-owner. So we'll, we'll run it up the food chain, but I, I, thank you for pointing that out. I, I, I don't really have a question, more of a comment. I, I, I just want to say um, you're, you're uncovering a lot of just the cultural dynamics that, uh, you know, I'm interested in seeing challenged in, in the sense of 
what is Vermont's agriculture today? What is it going to be in the future? And, and, um, you know, I think there's an incredibly important role for farmers like you, diversified ag, um, you know, in many cases, I, I hear wonderful examples of, of reclaiming uh, land that had been held by dairy, uh, in many cases, conventional dairy. So, so maybe we would argue some of the, those natural resources depleted and, and folks that are trying a new model that will actually be very good for soil health, likely for water quality and contribute to the ag economy. Um, this is not to burden you because you're uh, one player in actually thousands of similar farmers. But the fact is here in Senate agriculture, I've been on this committee now for five years, Mr. Chair. I, I'm losing count, maybe it's three years. Um, we hear a lot from dairy. They are very well organized. They have lobbyists. They have, you know, and there's what, uh, are we lucky to still have 700 dairy farms? Um, more like five or five fifty. Yeah, as I understand it, Hannah, maybe you can correct me. There's some three, three, four thousand smaller diversified producers like you guys, and 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 you know, I I just think it's really important. And and Nofa, rural Vermont, and others. There's a Berry Growers Association. You know, they're they're getting more regular in our process. But the fact is, we hear from dairy not because of uh of anything other than just that's the way it's been and and so i just want to um encourage you and anyone else we talk to along these lines to just 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 remember us and, and tell us what's going on we we just you know a few years ago when the pandemic hit we scrambled to figure out how to help farmers and how to help dairy was sort of straightforward in terms of money and connecting to the farms and the agency of agriculture told us that they didn't know they simply did not have a list of people that were farming that were not dairy i mean that was i was gobsmacked by that and and so we're making inroads we push them they they are now starting to to have that registry um just in in sense in the in the sense of a communication uh, availability. But, uh, you know, so it's not kind of fair to ask you of this, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Just, just please keep leaning on us. Please keep telling us your stories. Tell us, you know, we, we've set up a lot of programs uh, in a recognition of the growing diversity and need for our food systems, you know, whether it's working lands and other kinds of grant programs. My sense is those tend to be slightly bigger awards and, Folks like you, as you talk about a fencing award, is is small, too small for working lands, and and uh, you know, but a, but a key need and, and, a, and a way for you to contribute to the ag economy and 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 stewarding the land, and so just just helping us hear those stories is is incredibly valuable. I just wanted to say thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're we're in a phase where you know I'm applying for grants that are in the five to twenty thousand dollar range, and some I'm getting and some I'm not. Um, but but those are the kinds of scales of the project. You know, I I can build a wash pack station for my vegetable operation for less than twenty, but it would make a huge difference to the overall viability and future of my farm. Right. We used to have. Uh, well, go ahead. Sorry. No, that's fine, Chris. Go ahead. Well, there, there, there was a, the, I looked into this a little bit. There, there was through the agency a wash pack, is that what we call it? Um, yeah. A grant program that was federally funded. It sort of hangs there in limbo because there's no money. And I actually do think that is a place we could look to put, you know, a real modest amount of money could go a long way for farmers like Hannah. You're the washing station. You didn't get, you didn't qualify for that grant, Hannah. Uh, I applied for a different. I applied for a different grant through NOFA for funding to to do that project this year, and I will reapply. Um, but I think what Senator Pearson is talking about is the um, food safety grant that that used to exist for farmers like myself. 
Yeah, yeah you should just an example of a project. Yeah. Yeah, that, that program, Mr. Chair, is still there. You can still go to the website, but there's no money. So it's it's effectively on hold. They've and never so come and asked. You know, the agency never even told us that they ran out of money for that. I mean, uh, but anyway, um, we'll get that on our list of things, uh, you know, to ask them about. Uh, yeah, it's really weird how... <laughs> everything operates the agency well, you know, can't come and ask for anything that's not in their budget or they get their hand slapped from whoever they present their budget to before we ever get to see it so sometimes people like yourself and I have to tell us well they told us we were all they are all out of money and then we can add it but they can't come and ask for it it's a uh, it's kind of a crazy process, but um, I believe Brian Senator Collimore had a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, much in line with Senator Pearson, not so much a question as a comment, although I do have a question. Um, so I'm just admiring um, your whole presentation. Um, as you related it, I'm getting tired myself because you must be exhausted to try to do everything you just told us you were doing and your husband has this other business going. So I'm sure the, the bulk of the uh, load kind of falls on your shoulders. And uh, I'm heartened to know that there are at least avenues for you, uh, you know, to go to try to get help, whether that's uh, funding help or advice or just uh, informational kind of situation. So it's good to know that those are out there for you. Uh, and don't feel badly that you haven't, uh, found every last little resource you might have because I've been on this committee for six years and I still have no idea. In many cases, uh, someone will mention something and I'll say, geez, that's the first time I ever heard about it. So uh, I just want to say way to go. And uh, yeah, as Chris said, uh, the diversified uh, section of our ag is incredibly important as we begin to uh, kind of move away from uh, what was, you know, uh, all dairy at one point. So here's my question, because you are in essence doing all the work, are you hopeful that you'll reach a point? Cause you did make a point about, you know, you're just sort of starting out and you're systemically trying to put things in place. Are you eventually hoping that you'll be able to hire some help and uh, that you won't have to do the whole thing yourself? Or are you really intent on staying as uh, the same size, I guess? Uh, that's a great question. We've been doing quite a bit of uh, looking within and farm planning and business planning. Um, right now, we're taking it one year at a time. Our kids are four and one. So, you know, um, this year I hired some childcare three days a week and I hired one farm employee one day a week. And that's a big move for me um, because up until now, I've done both entirely myself. So, Yes, we intend to outsource some of the work, um, but you know, my husband's construction business, it, he, he stopped hiring folks in 2020 when the pandemic hit and it was so hard to find anyone and, and follow all of those precautions and found that just staying small and lean actually increased his profitability. And you know, we're, we're figuring all of that out. Um, and each year it's kind of a juggle to figure out how much time and resources we can put into this business and that business and our family and how we're going to make it all work. So yes, hopefully, I, you know, I would love to have employees attract and retain great employees um, over time. But for right now, I don't intend to grow so quickly that I need them um, until my kids are hopping on a school bus, you know, uh, but, but we'll see. I, yeah, it's, I'm not sure. It's a good question. It's, it's okay, almost okay. like, you know, as we talk, I'm, I'm thinking like just navigating all of these programs could be a full-time job or yeah. doing just the marketing for my farm could be a full-time job. And I'm, I'm doing all of that plus plumbing and there's the actual production of food and, you know, um, it's, it's a lot. So yeah, we, we try to outsource what we can and we're getting better at that over time, but all of that takes quite a leap of faith that it's going to pay off. You're making me feel tired again. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And please, uh, Senator Pearson said, stay in touch with us. Um, if there's things that you can say, hey, you know, those five people in that committee, maybe they have an answer for me. Okay. Uh, Anthony, just, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just wondering with all your diversification, um, what's the one, is there one piece of your farm, one part of your operation that you think has the most potential for growth? Uh, yes, I think, I think our grass fed meat has the most potential for growth um, because we have so much grass. We have, you know, 80 acres of good forage and we just came from a place that had four acres of scrubby forage. So uh, when at, at our prior location, we were more focused on pork and chicken, um, pretty grain intensive meats. And we are shifting now into more rotational grazing and grass fed meats. And I think the demand is there. We see it all the time. We're selling out of meat like crazy. Um, but okay. personally, yeah, there, yeah. I was asked if you had any issues with slaughtering yeah. and access to slaughterhouse and meat yes. processing. Yes, absolutely. And I could go on about that for another half hour, but I, I want to give other people some time too. Um, but, but yes, we definitely feel the bottlenecks of the slaughterhouse processing industry very mm -hmm. much. So this year, mm -hmm. you know, we away from selling mm -hmm. half and whole pork shares to only yeah. selling retail cuts. We've shifted our business model quite a bit because of it. So do you do on-prem slaughter or custom slaughter or a kinner slaughter or how do you do that? In we, we process all of our chickens ourselves on farm. And just recently we've run into some insurance snafus, but we have uh, now, I, I've written a lengthy SOP so that we could be covered by our insurance um, to process our own poultry on farm. And we we follow all of the ag regulations. And um, uh, so yes, poultry on farm, but we bring our pork to a slaughterhouse, a USDA inspected slaughterhouse so that we can sell retail cuts. Yeah. We've had a lot of discussion um, earlier this year in regards to on-farm, there is a, a law and a rule on on-farm slaughter. Um, and you know, we didn't know how, if you sold like a, a pig to two people um, and you just take it to the slaughterhouse and have it cut in half and each person gets a half, or do you sell just small pieces? <clears throat> You? We, used, we used to do the former, what you're just saying. Um, and this year we're shifting away from that model. Last year, so I, you know, I set my price in the winter for the coming year and I, I used to sell whole hog shares and half shares. And what happened last year is I set the price in the winter and then grain prices went up so much and slaughterhouse prices went up so much. And then two days before we brought the pigs to slaughter the the processing facility said, oh, by the way, we can't smoke anything this year and we can't make sausage, which is of course what everyone wants when they're buying a pig. So uh, we, we can't take that risk anymore. So now we are only selling retail cuts um, so that we can control the price at the point of sale and we don't get burned um, by, by forces outside of our farm business. Other questions? Well, which you, know, you talked a lot about the different stresses that you're under, which is totally understandable. And I want to just mention that part of what you pointed out before was that we do give a lot of attention to dairy, as we've all mentioned. And part of the dilemma with that is we're giving a lot to dairy because dairy has a lot of problems, you know, pollution problems, water quality problems, manure problems. And we're, we find ourselves stuck in a position where we're basically propping up a, an industry that is too big to fail in some cases, given the situation of our economy, as opposed to small diversified operations like yours, which don't get the attention they deserve because they, you know, you don't rise up to the limits as you mentioned. But I'm wondering which of these, which of the parts of your farming operation keep you awake the most at night? Uh, that's a good question. I, we're we're so early in setting up infrastructure here that. Um, the, the setting up of systems keeps me awake at night. And that's that's not 
maybe answering your question exactly because I think you're asking me which enterprise keeps me up at night. Um, yeah, I'd say that's, just not, that's that's a legitimate answer. Yeah, I'm just just like the fact that we have to <laughs> renovate this dairy barn and learn how to pour concrete over an existing slab and then figure out how to install frost-free hydrants and you know trench that line out to the garden and put up a greenhouse this year and all these things we are we are doing ourselves and we don't we don't necessarily know how we're just learning as we go um, while also running the business so we're in so the thick of it. all of it keeps me up <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, well uh, Anything else, Chris? Any other questions? And Hannah, you're more than welcome to stay on. Uh, we're gonna uh, call on uh, Patrick. No, Chuck, I guess, is up next. Or Patrick, uh, Chris? Yeah, I, I, I'm. I feel like this is a nosy question, Hannah, but, but um, I'm always interested in how small operations and you started on another plot of land how you are able to secure land and the and the reason i ask is um because i worry that as we see particularly small mid-sized dairy go out of business too often they get gobbled up by the bigger dairy down the road and in my opinion we need to interrupt that cycle and 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 shift so that more producers like you are able to access land. Is this conserved land? Did you work through the, the um, land trust? Can you, what, I don't wanna be prying into your finances, but what can you tell us in terms of lessons that might help us, uh, you know, help the next farmer in your situation? No, that's fine. Um, I'm an open book. We, uh, we, this is conserved land. It was conserved through the Vermont Land Trust. Um, and the quick story of the farm is that it was farmed conventionally as a dairy by, um, by one man for his entire life. Um, he died at 98 and his children did not want the farm. They wanted this land to turn into a housing development. And so kind of on his deathbed, he signed away the rights. Uh, I mean, he signed it over and said that it must be conserved because he wanted it to stay in the working landscape. So his children are not super happy with us, um, but it went, the land went into a family trust and the, some of the family members um, reached out to the land trust to identify a farmer that would be a good fit with this land and location. So we were contacted by the land trust because we were in touch with them already looking for a farm that would be appropriate for us and we saved up a lot of money and um, you know bought this land for an affordable price considering how much land we have and and the huge value of it but we bought it at agricultural value as conserved farmland <clears throat> okay thank yeah, you that's 100, great 180 acres of farmland is, you know, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, you should be able to grow and grow and grow some more. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we'll be able to outgrow this place. <laughs> and I hope to leave it to my sons. Well, um, if there are no other questions, we'll, we'll move to Patrick. Um, and you're welcome to stay on, Hannah, if you want to listen. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I, I run and own a farm with my wife about 10 minutes from Montpelier. Uh, we're right up Route 12. Uh, we grow mixed vegetables and we provide uh, vegetables weekly for eight months of the year to 150 families in Montpelier. Today, yesterday was our first delivery day. So we go around delivering to homes of a lot of elderly people, a lot of people that are too busy to come to the farm. And then the other half of our CSA, people come right to our farm and pick up. And that's what's happening today, the first one of the year. So we're able to do that eight months of the year right now. Um, we also bought an old dairy farm. It's 
Uh, originally we bought 19 acres and we've just added to it. So we have about 35 acres right on Brightsville Reservoir. And three or four years ago, we, we in, when we purchased this farm, it was, the house was falling down. The barn was in really bad. Structurally, the barn was okay, but it had been abandoned when the bulk milk tank law came into effect and it was a small dairy, so it was no longer um, viable. So it had 20 or 30 years of decay. Um, and we applied for a produce safety grant in 2019 and, and received $10,000. Uh, we, we got an additional $12,000 from NOFA as the farm of the month. And then we put about that much money into uh, transitioning that barn into a place where we wash and pack all of our produce. Uh, that $10,000, I mean, we've also been able to get $500 grants here or maybe $1,000 there, but $10,000 is a sizable chunk for us uh, to really make an impact and a difference. Uh, we couldn't have done that by ourselves. We were able to insulate part of the barn uh, and complete, yeah, bring electricity there, water there. So our next jump will be to serve the community year round. Uh, with another grant like that in the ten dollars to $20,000 range, we could really um, build the facilities we need to do that. So I, I think 10, 000, with $10,000, that made a huge impact for our farm. We're able to employ six people for eight months of the year, six local people. Uh, we're able to do a couple hundred thousand dollars of business and provide a service to our community that is not being provided by their farms, which is a, a home delivery of fresh harvested that day, very healthy produce. Um, and that's my, my sentiment would be that to really achieve the state's goals of, I think it's 25% local food being consumed um, here coming up, we really need to support vegetable farms as well. Uh, because it's a, it's an integral part of a healthy diet, and um, you know we're we're operating at a small to medium scale, and we're able to feed families and provide uh, to restaurants as well in the area. Do you, do you sell to any of the schools, Patrick? Uh, we don't. No, <clears throat> because we do have a. You know, we do have a program where uh, local producers can sell directly to uh, school food systems. Um, I'm not sure if you deal directly with the with the kitchen, you know, the guy that runs or the woman that runs the kitchen, or if you deal through the superintendent's office, but <clears throat> we we really encourage hot lunch programs to buy local foods and help subsidize that to a, you know, a, to a certain point to get uh, fresh and wholesome Vermont grown produce into our schools. So maybe that's uh, an area you could check out. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point. It's another really important um, to meet the state's goals, it's a really important area because I think the national lunch standard is that a, a cheese pizza meets the vegetable requirement. So to really get, I mean, the, the freshness of what we're producing and get that into school, get kids eating that is just critically important for a local few, food, food future. We have sold to Harwood High School a little bit, um, but that was kind of through someone we knew reached out to us. So we haven't had too much luck selling to other schools yet. And we also really concentrate on selling, yeah, growing what we know we can sell. So we built customers like Red Hen and Woodbelly and Farmers to You in Middlesex uh, that we can really plan on a couple wedding caterers uh, that we can, we really know because of our scale, we're only growing two and a half acres of vegetables very intensively. So because of our scale, uh, we really want to know we can sell it before we plant it. Yeah, yeah, uh, Anthony. 
you talk about wanting to know you're going to sell it before you grow it. And I'm just wondering, what's the biggest demand you're seeing? What are some of the vegetables that there seems to be a growing market for? That's a great question. Um, you know, there are a lot of great farms in our area, and I think the area where we could grow the most is providing um, produce in the winter. You know, our mm -hmm. same customer base that we built up, if we can provide to them year round, that is the best way to build our, our particular business. So that would take, um, yeah, maybe we've got, we've built up a lot of greenhouse space, but being able to effectively heat some of that greenhouse space to grow greens in the winter. And there's such a demand for fresh vegetables when um, all the vegetables in the winter here are coming from California that you would find in the supermarkets. So our biggest opportunity is fresh greens in the winter. Um, and if we have the greens, then we find we can sell the other roots that we can produce and store as well. But if we don't have the greens, then um, it's harder for us to sell the other things. <laughs> And do do you 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 have converted your barn to some degree? Do you have uh, is there any possibilities of uh, indoor grow in that or uh, or like uh, fast freeze or do people really require and want fresh uh, veggies? Uh, well, we produced so many excess greenhouse crops last year that we did. Um, just freeze raw cut peppers and tomato sauce that is uncooked. And, and this actually today will be the first trial of putting that out for our spring CSA. Um, so things that we processed last fall, but definitely if we could figure out how to, to build, um, it's in our plan to build a farm kitchen. And if we could have some funding to help do that, uh, that's another way that we could get more local food to our customers and build our customer base even more. Because there's definitely a demand for um, all the things that we can't keep fresh all winter, but if we can freeze it, um, there's a demand for it. Uh, other questions, uh, Anthony? What role has the Ag Department played in supporting you as a startup? And I'm just wondering, I mean, we, we, run, we know some of the issues around meat production and slaughtering and whatnot and the problems that people run into there. I'm wondering whether or not you have a, a, a relationship with the Ag Department, whether they come out and test your, not test your products, but uh, trying to think of the word, but. Um, we've, never, we, we've never had the Ag Department out here. Um, yeah, to my understanding, there's a threshold that we're not quite at where they would come and potentially test our wash water and see our wash station. Last time I checked, I think it was if you're doing over a half a million dollars of sales. Um, where the Ag Department has really helped us was with the Produce Safety Grant. Uh, I always check about working lands grants, value-added grants, but the admin burden is pretty hard because it's just my wife and I uh, doing all the marketing, all the CSA management, all the production management. So we don't have anyone to help us write grants. Uh, and the produce safety grant was through the state's portal and it was relatively easy to have everything prepared and just plug it in when it opened up. Um, but some of the other grants uh, are more complicated. We also have applied for a cover crop grant, but the, the compensation we were gonna get was for our scale, so such a minimal amount um, that I didn't even pursue it. I think we were awarded a grant if we continued to do some paperwork for a, that, but it wouldn't have covered the seeds that we needed to, we, we plant two to three acres of cover crop a year and spend, yeah, in the realm of $1,000 of seed uh, cover crop seed, and I think the grant was for a couple hundred dollars. The uh, <clears throat> have you ever dealt with VHCB, Vermont Housing Conservation Board? Uh, we have. Well, they they have what they call a ready program, where grant writers are employed uh, by VHCB that could. It's supposed to help uh, small grant uh, applicants 
get through the application process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's a possibility there where if you were looking for a grant of a certain type, you could call their VHCB and ask for their ready program director and see if they might be able to help you with a grant writing proposal. Wonderful. Yeah, we, I didn't mention that we did go through the VHCB farm viability program. Uh, yeah. That is, you know, run in coordination with NOFA and that really provided help uh, yeah, with our long-term planning, our business planning. Uh, through that, we were able to access some education funds and have some uh, older farmers mentor us. Yeah, farmers with more experience. That was a huge help. And then VHCB did also uh, come out to our house and do a bunch of lead testing. Our house was built, so we live uh, where the Conservation Corps lived when they built the, the Wrightsville Dam. We're on the property that housed a couple thousand people to our knowledge and, and our house was where some of the officers uh, lived and it was just oh. riddled with lead paint and lead dust and VHCP <laughs> sent someone out to do thousands of dollars of testing, which we never could have done on our own. And that, that really was a huge help and it informed us and because uh, we have two little daughters, a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. So at that time, my wife was pregnant and because of the results that we got, we really decided to just completely gut the house, take everything out and, you know, make sure that our family was safe. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, do you have to pump any water from uh, streams or anything for your gardens? Uh, we do not at this point. Uh, we just run off of our, our, of our house well. Yeah. Yeah, it's a vulnerability for us. Uh, and moving forward, it's something that we need to have a backup because we're at the end of a Washington Co-op electric line and we're off in the last, there's only four houses past us on the line. So uh, our, our power has been out multiple times for multiple days. So that's a, one vulnerability for our farm is being able to function in a power outage. Um, if we had, you know, our greenhouse crops really need water, our wash and pack operation needs water, and all of our seedlings that we grow to plant out. Um, so we're, what, go ahead. What utility are you associated with? Uh, Washington Electric Co-op. And they don't, they don't do uh, battery packs or, you know, a lot of people including myself years back, didn't have battery packs. So we put propane uh, driven generators in for back up to poor utility lines. But now they have these battery packs that, um, you know, the utilities are pushing. Have you looked into having one of those installed uh, at your farm to uh, supply you with electricity if the line goes out? We have not yet. We just have a small generator we can, as a kind of a lifeline, we can take from place to place, um, but nothing to run our water pump. Uh, because of the cost, we've just put so much um, of any of our profits into uh, building the farm to where it is that that's really in the next phase making sure that all of our backup systems are in place. When we purchased the farm, we looked at doing solar panels, uh, but the cost was just so prohibitive. Uh, and we, we were in a situation where we just don't wanna take on any more debt too. Uh, so we haven't, I, I'm very interested in a, in a battery uh, pack system or a, a backup battery rather than installing a propane generator. Yeah. Well, of course, these are relatively new, um, and I, we haven't looked into as a committee uh, ways of helping, um, you know, helping to get these small, uh, these small agricultural production facilities, uh, maybe grants for, you know, to help 
to help put in something like this, but it sounds like it's something that we should put on our to-do list and, and to look at to see if there's some way <clears throat> that we could do some cost sharing somehow uh, to, you know, because if you can't get water on your farm and your plants are out there choking, uh, it's pretty disastrous. I, I will mention that um, it hasn't been the foremost concern for us yet because we uh, have decided to really build our soils. Uh, the resiliency we look at um, is in our soils as much as any kind of technological solution we have. Uh, so we've, we've built um, our soils from 4 to 5% organic matter up to over 10% organic matter. Uh, and every percentage organic matter that you improve in the soil sequesters an incredible amount of carbon and also holds, uh, I, off the top of my head, I think it's 40,000 gallons of extra water that is held in the soil for every 1% per acre of organic matter. So yes. in the last couple really dry years, we really just water when we are transplanting or to get seeds to germinate, and then we don't have to water again. Um, yeah. Our soil today is so moist uh, because of all of the compost, all of the cover cropping, and our farming practices. So I think that's a, a benefit to, yeah, the, you know, the science about soil is, is growing and changing so much, and we know so much more now. And so we really look at the resiliency of our farm is how we take care of our principal resource, which is our soil. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, other questions for uh, Patrick? Also, yeah. Um, uh, Chris? Well, just a, a word of thanks, Patrick. We, we've been funding uh, the, I can't remember the name, but I think we call it the Ecosystem Payment Service. Group Services. I can't remember, but the, the concept is promote soil development uh, and restoration and, and find a way to remunerate farmers and uh it's always heartening to hear people that are doing it I, I think a lot of farmers are doing it um just for the intrinsic value for the the straight return on investment that you're getting and uh, i just want to say as one voice here thank you for for doing that I, I i think it's not really a question it's clearly vitally important uh for a state in any number of ways uh, but especially that is seeing increased rain, increasing tense rain events to protect our downtowns. Montpelier has a history of flooding trauma. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you and, and keep up the good work. It's kind of inspiring. Yeah, uh, there are no other questions. Um, do we have Chuck on the line? We do, yes. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Chuck. Or can you hear us, Chuck? Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, I need to run. But thank you, Senator Pearson, and thank you, everyone. Um, we're really grateful to be able to operate in our community and serve our community. So thanks for all your work, too. Yeah. Great, this is uh, Chuck Wooster. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Great, thanks Good very morning, much. Good morning, Chuck. And, um, have you been on the line so you've heard uh, uh, what we're doing and things? Yes, I have. I heard uh, the testimony from Hannah and from Patrick. Yeah, very, very good. And that was good testimony that we received. Uh, well, welcome to uh, the committee and um, glad you could hang on and, and make it. Well, thanks so much. And thank you to the whole uh, committee. I really appreciate this opportunity and I appreciate your interest. Um, and it was fun to hear Hannah and Patrick because our farm uh, started at their scale, maybe even a little bit smaller than their scale. Uh, and we have grown uh, quite a bit. We're now in our 23rd year. Uh, my farm name is Sunrise Farm. We're just south of the VA hospital in White River, so town of Hartford, Windsor County. Uh, and our sales this year, we're up around a half a million dollars in sales. 
So that, by Vermont standards, I think puts us kind of in the middle uh, on the uh, on the vegetable side of things. So I might have a slightly different perspective um, than the other two, which I think will be hopefully will uh, add to what they've said. Um, I'll give you just a quick thumbnail of our business, which will I think set up what I really want to speak about. Um, but as I said, this is our 23rd year, about a half a million dollars in sales. I have three uh, employees who work year round. Uh, and at the full season, uh, there'll be 10 of us, you know, June, July. Two thirds of our business is certified organic vegetables. We're certified through uh, VOF, NOFA. And all those vegetables go into a 400 family CSA. Uh, that's all on farm. We're, we're quite close to White River. Also, we're very close to Lebanon and Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, so we've got about 40,000 people kind of in our immediate neighborhood. Uh, and we're lucky enough that people uh, are willing to come to our farm every week. Um, they can choose what they what they take home but once they get there, and we have pick your own flowers and herbs and, and things like that. Um, so as I said, about two thirds of our business uh, is these organic vegetables. The other third is a variety of things. Uh, we raise chickens on pasture for meat. We raise chickens on pasture for eggs, uh, lamb on pasture for meat. Uh, we do a bunch of sugaring, uh, at least at a small scale, to keep us busy in March. Uh, and we also have a farm stand where we sell other farms products, mostly from our neighborhood, but kind of if we can get a good cheese or something from you know Jasper Hill or uh, another producer in Vermont, we'll definitely bring that into our stand for our people. Um, over the years, I've been a very grateful recipient of several grants uh, that you folks have helped set up. Uh, one was a produce safety grant that we received a few years ago for about $3,500 to repair a, a well casing uh, on the well that we use for washing our vegetables. So that was an excellent upgrade. Uh, we also received a Working Lands uh, grant of $20,000 a couple years ago to build a on-farm compost facility. And we now take in food scraps, both from our CSA members and also from the community at large. Uh, and we turn that into compost that we can use um, on our farm. So that's been a absolutely wonderful project that was made possible in uh, in large part by the Working Lands Program. So uh, my my applause uh, for that program and, and your work in helping to fund that uh, every year. Um, in a larger perspective, I'll tell you a little bit about our land. So um, we actually, we started on a, uh, abandoned dairy farm, sort of keeping that theme going here this morning. <clears throat> the land base had been reduced to 20 acres and it was not an active farm. So my wife and I were able to purchase it just with a normal home mortgage uh, as a place to live. So we didn't have to go through any agricultural uh, funding sources for that. Um, after 15 years, the business had gotten, had become large enough that that site was too small. So we purchased a second farm site, uh, which is right on Route 5 and it's quite a prominent spot in our town and uh, we were able to get a, uh, a excellent loan from Yankee Farm Credit uh, to make that purchase and to expand our operation. So we have two sites. Um, we have about uh, 40 acres of cleared land. Um, and of that 40, only six is flat enough for vegetable production. Um, so I think as, as Chris mentioned, we have more intense rain these days um, and the land that we can grow row crops on, it needs to be really flat or close to it uh, because of the risk of soil erosion. So out of all this wonderful uh, land that we own, only six acres uh, is good enough to grow vegetables on. So we've got about 30 acres of grass uh, and we've done a variety of things. We graze all of it. We have at various times attempted to make our own hay, although we've discovered that our scale is just too small uh, to afford that level of capitalization for the hay equipment. So now we buy hay from our neighbors, uh, which is also good. Um, so your question today about diversified farms, I think is a great one. Um, and I'll give you an example here. So uh, we've been raising sheep now for over 20 years. And unfortunately we've lost money on sheep for 18 of them. I think we've now moved into the black, but uh, we were in the red for um, a long time. And so sheep is a great example. So um, these days, if we can, we need to sell a lamb for somewhere north of $400 in order for us to make any money doing it. 
And if we can hold on to 50 bucks at the end of that, of that 400, then I'll feel like we're doing a good job. So you can see that, you know, 50 bucks a lamb, it's tough to make that into a, a freestanding business. Um, and in fact, for many years, we've taken advantage of the on-farm slaughter law, although of late uh, we haven't, and I'd be happy to talk more about that if, if that's uh, of interest. Um, but right now we're selling about 80 lambs a year. If we can make 50 bucks a lamb, that's $4,000. So that's great. It's, you know, we're in the black, it's net positive, but $4,000 doesn't support you know, me, let alone employees or, any, or anything else. So it brings me sort of into the structure of our business, which is to say we almost have a bunch of businesses, none of which could stand alone. Um, you know, the chickens, the eggs are similar, the margins are thin. Um, they're all profitable, but, they're, but not enough. There's not a large enough scale to turn it into a business. So our solution, of course, is to bundle a number of these things together um, and turn it into a business. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, mostly vegetables, but also the chicken, eggs, uh, lamb, and syrup, it all comes together into a business um, that's viable. But in order for that to work, each of the individual pieces has to work. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about the meat side of it in particular. And that's because um, meat, um, well, I'll, I'll step back one, I'll take one step back. So vegetable production is kind of the same, no matter how you do it. If you do it in California, you're doing it with machines. If you're doing it in Vermont, you're doing it maybe with some trackers, some by hand. But the general process is the same. You put the seeds or the plants out there, you stick them in a row, you weed them, you water them, you feed them, then you go back and you harvest them. And so it's kind of the same thing at whatever scale you're talking about. Meat, however, is totally different. Um, in the industrial model, the animals stay indoors uh, and, the, and the, the companies bring the food to them and they take the manure away. Um, in the Vermont setting, most of the Vermont setting, um, the animals wander around outside. And so we, the farmers, have to go out and bring them food, water, move their fencing, things like that. So we're creating fundamentally a different product, but we're also doing it in a fundamentally different way, um, which leads to the problem of price. Um, on the vegetable side, my organic veggies, uh, you know, depending on time of year and other details, they might be comparable with conventional prices. They might be half again more. They might be twice as much, something like that. That's kind of the spread. But the meat that we're raising on pasture um, is three or four times what you can you know, sort of get. You can get ground beef for you know, maybe a quarter of what you can get it for from us. So, and that's because fundamentally, we're raising meat in, in a much different way. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the advantages of, of pasture-raised meat, the health benefits, the environmental benefits, the tourism benefits, the beauty benefits, um, the carbon sequestration benefits are all there. Uh, but it makes for a much, much uh, different potential market. And I sort of think of it in my own brain is, honestly, there really isn't a competitive market uh, for meat um, because the price spread is so huge. Um, we're lucky that we have customers who value this product, who purchase this product, um, but it's not something that most Vermonters um, you know, can afford, honestly. Um, so that puts us in, into a tough spot. And the way sort of the, you know, the marketplace of meat is set up nationally and internationally, that's not likely to change anytime soon. Um, and so my testimony today, I really wanted to try and zero in on this question uh, with you folks and put it in front of you because as you look around Vermont, um, especially if you step outside of the Champlain Valley, there's a lot of land that's not flat enough for vegetables. So despite the great success of, uh, you know, of the vegetable sector in the last two, three decades, we're never going to be able to use that you know, dairy land, that land that's coming out of dairy farms, um, because we can't grow vegetables on the steep hillsides like that. So if we're going to keep all of that land somehow in agriculture, it's got to have some animals on it in some way. Um, it's just we, we can't do it with veg. So we got to get some animals out there. And as I said, it's incredibly challenging to try and, you know, create a business uh, on, on the basis of meat production in Vermont. So I don't have any magic solutions to this, of course, and I'm sure you guys don't either. But I thought it might be worth a quick conversation about, like, how could we, how could we do that? because um, it would certainly benefit our business because we do raise animals on pasture. 
and because we do need a way to use our 30 acres of non-vegetable land in some way that adds to the bottom line. Um, but I think it's very emblematic of the whole state, you know, especially the eastern, you know, the eastern two thirds. That this is the kind of land base that we have. So, you know, a couple of things. Uh, one was mentioned a few minutes ago: the payment for ecosystem services model. Um, I've been following that only sort of peripherally, and it's super complicated on you know who gets paid for what and where the money comes from. But that idea um, is so important and so central. Um, to what we're trying to do in Vermont here. You know, the ecological damage from industrial meat is enormous. The ecological benefit uh, of, of meat, uh, pastured meat in Vermont is enormous, um, but there needs to be some way economically that we can capture that, that benefit. Um, so the ecosystem services um, group that you guys have been funding is, is doing great work on that. I, I have no idea what the final outcome will be and I hope that it's actionable, but I would certainly uh, point all of us in that direction. Um, there's also work I think that could be done at the state level in trying to promote the idea of grass-fed, pasture-raised meat. Um, and for you know that quick list I ran through half-jokingly, which is you know the health benefits, the beauty benefits, the tourism benefits, um, the local economy benefits are all are all there. And if we could really focus on that you know, kind of Vermont brand um, that we are creating the meat that that people want and need. Um, you've, I'm sure, read many articles in sort of, um, you know, in the media that talk about how meat is terrible for the climate and terrible for you. Um, and all those articles make the same mistake, which is they're all talking about the industrial meat that's locked up inside. And so there's great work for us to do as individual farmers, and I think as a state, to really say, hey, we can do this. Uh, we've got this land base. We grow some of the best grass in the world <clears throat> here in Vermont. And, and uh, animals are the way for us to uh, take advantage of that. And then the final thing I want to touch on too, which uh, is the slaughter side of it, which I know you all have done great work on. You've taken advantage of the on-farm slaughter law for a bunch of years. Um, it solves a number of problems, mainly the problem of transportation, uh, of having to have a vehicle and a trailer to move animals around. It also gets you out of the bottleneck of scheduling, which I know you guys are also aware of. And I think uh, you know, from the humane standpoint, it's nice for the animals to never have to leave their home base. Um, so I'm in favor of it. There's one, there's one aspect of it that hasn't, has always kind of stuck in my craw, which is we have to have an itinerant slaughterer do it. I understand that that might be language that's coming from the USDA. And I can see in the abstract why you sort of want a third party there. Um, but as a practical matter, I'm selling meat directly to the people that I'm putting it into their hands. Um, and it would be much more beneficial for my farm if we could actually do the slaughter and all that ourselves. Um, because as I said, we're trying to you know, fit these little businesses together. So I'm looking for work for my people to do. So having to then hire someone else to come in, you know, I'm, in some ways I might as well hire the slaughterhouse to do it as long as I can get, I can get the date. Um, and then the other piece of on-farm on, on -farm slaughter, it's a great program. And by design, and probably importantly, it's, it's, it's very small. It's for small producers. Um, it's already sort of, it's not big enough for us, even at our medium scale, um, which is fine. But I think that as a committee um, and as a state, we need to figure out ways to make that slaughter more affordable. Um, you know, I understand why the agency is really focused on facilities, um, because the USDA is really focused on facilities. Uh, and they don't want exemptions and they don't want alternatives. And I totally understand the reasoning for that, but it creates an almost insurmountable obstacle for someone to move, um, you know, to become a larger producer. As I said, if I can sell a lamb for, you know, 400 bucks, I'm happy, but 125 of that is gonna go to the slaughterhouse. Another 25 to 50 of it's just gonna go for me moving the animals back and forth. Um, so, you know, maybe 40% of my expense is being incurred at the last minute there. And so um, you can see it's a really, really tight margin. And so I don't know quite how the state can help if indeed we're gonna go the facilities approach. And I think you know, based on what the agency has said we are, um, are there ways uh, that we can make that more affordable for kind of small to medium producers? Um, are there transportation services that the state could set up or subsidize? Is there um, some payment that the state could be making to slaughterhouses to keep slots available for small 
producers or to subsidize the small producer in some way. Um, I don't quite know. I'm just throwing these ideas out randomly. But I think the important thing to focus on is the slaughter thing continues to be a huge bottleneck. Um, and the on-farm piece is great as far as it goes, but that by itself is not going to be enough for us to figure out how are we going to use this incredible grass that we have in Vermont um, as, as we continue to see this transition away from dairy. Um, so I think that's a, that's the list of what I had uh, pre-prepared. I'm happy to answer questions, and I hope I didn't move into <clears throat> any uh, random directions here. No, we we appreciate uh, the well-rounded uh, issues that you brought uh, before us. Um, and uh, I guess to start where you left off, uh, we spent quite a lot of time, even this year, on the issue of on-farm slaughter. And you you don't have the... The owner of the animal uh, doesn't have to have an itinerant slaughterer, but the farmer, the way the federal law uh, was handed down, what they would allow is the owner of the animal to perform the slaughter, or they could hire uh, an itinerant slaughterer to uh, slaughter the animal and but the farmer it's very clear that the farmer in no way can take part in the slaughter of the animal and it's it's kind of a crazy thing um, you know and I don't I don't know of any any way around this um, because you're the farmer and the owner is somebody from say Hanover or White River and they certainly don't know how to slaughter an animal and do it in a, you know, you want this done in a humane and safe way. Um, the only, and I don't even know how to get around that other than early on, you said you and your wife, I think, on the farm. Is that right? Yes, we uh, we co-own it. Um, as a practical matter, I, I, I'm the farmer and she has some off-farm income, but yes, we do co-own it. Yeah, so your wife couldn't be the owner of the animal and sell the animal to the... To the uh, people and then and then um, you could do the slaughter. I I don't know, yeah, you know, that there may be a creative way around this, but we haven't come up with one at this point. Yeah, I, I appreciate you're looking into it and it's interesting that it's sort of just that one little line in the statute, but for us it makes all the difference, you know. I need to have someone there because we need to, you know, we, we compost all of the, you know, all of the parts that aren't going to get turned into meat. So, you know, we need someone there to assist, but you know, most of the time you're just kind of standing there. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. honestly, you know, we, we do some slaughter for our own purposes and purposes and um, you know, we certainly could do it, but so I understand that may be outside of your uh, control, but I would just again, flag that as an unfortunate, uh, an unfortunate piece of this. Yeah, we have <clears throat> we have sent one or two letters off to um, our congressional delegation and one directly to USDA trying to get uh, clarification uh, to make this you know more convenient uh, and better. But it's um, certainly a rough not to crack uh, because they have these you know very stringent rules and regulations and um, so anyways we're still beating away at this but to take a sheep and a lamb and raise it and then uh, get it to uh, value it big enough to so it values out at $400 and only end up with 50 is 
not a very uh, big profit when it takes, you know, all year to do this. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, it's tough in the marketplace, too, that, you know, people say, holy smokes, like, look at these guys, they're making bank, you know, $400 for a sheep, you know, good work if you can get it. And then I'm sitting on my side saying, you know, I'd sell to you for 350 but then I'd make zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The itinerant slaughterers charge $125? No, they, uh, uh, it's more like 50 bucks, 60 bucks, something like that. Um, but then we then need to take the carcasses to a facility um, that can cut and wrap them. Yeah. So, you know, a, pos yeah. a possibility for us would be that we could build our own, um, you know, cut and wrap, basically our own butcher shop. Um, and then we could do that second part of it. Um, and I've thought a bit about that. And, you know, as with any piece of equipment that you build or buy, you need to use it a certain amount you know, in order to pay for itself. And so it gets you into that scale problem of, you know, are we going to raise 200 lambs, you know, in order to justify a building like that? So we're sort of in this, you know, we're kind of in an in-between spot that we're, we're big enough you know, that we've got, you know, we have a real business going, but we're not so big that we can afford our own, you know, dedicated slaughter or, or butcher facilities. Uh, Chris? <laughs> Chuck, thanks for your time today and then i suppose if you did that facility and invited others in to use it you'd be in a whole nother universe of of regulation right that's correct yeah especially on the wastewater side and and this is really where um you know, the building gets expensive you have to really have you have to have a usda certified facility you're essentially building a house you know a small house yeah. you need obviously clean water coming in you need some kind of septic or town, you know, sewer on the other side and, you know, and wiring and lighting and everything to code. So it's kind of like building a small house. And so you can see you know, the amount of money that either would be needed to subsidize that or the amount of business that the farm needs to afford that is, you know, it's, it's considerable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, we run into these federal problems that just drive us all crazy. But uh, anyway, I'm glad you're finding finding ways to piece it all together. So, yeah. I think, um, go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, I think this, you know, the focus, I hate, I hate to move the focus over to subsidies because I think like all of us, the idea here is to compete in a marketplace. And, but as I pointed out, I think the marketplace on the meat side is so distorted that it's sort of not possible. And so, I think your work exploring things like payment for ecosystem services, or maybe, you know, is there a way for there to be, I don't, I don't know, like the, the transportation is a big bottleneck. Um, you know, maybe there's ways that, uh, you know, slaughterhouses can be, can be encouraged to keep spots open, you know, with some sort of a subsidy. And, you know, I hate to go down that road, but if we can't change the regs, if, if it really does mean we all have to go through a slaughterhouse, then we're going to have to figure out an economical way for us to go through the slaughterhouse. Yeah, I I like the idea uh, that your customers that come to the farm, uh, I think you said they they bring their uh, scraps and it goes into your compost pile. Uh, that's a really good way to uh, get off farm. Uh, nutrients back to the farm right through the compost uh, system and put back on your soils. That's uh, that's a very uh, good plan you've got there. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been very successful. Of course, it's a wonderful educational piece, right? People can pick up their vegetables one week and bring back the scraps the next. Uh, and as yeah. you said, we're capturing this this great, essentially free nutrient source getting it back on the soil and you know a lot of that is thanks to the universal uh recycling and, and waste law that the legislature and, and the governor put through so um it's been a really really great thing uh, we just started you know applying the compost uh last fall so it's a little early to see you know great gains in the soil organic matter but we're going to see them um and so it's just a perfect uh it's a perfect program and and again thanks to you know the state both for helping to fund it but also to putting the putting the right regulations in place to make it possible. 
Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> other questions? If if we got that meat thing straightened out, how how much could you or how many more could you handle, say, in your operation to and get rid of if we could get something like that, you know, more streamlined? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, as Hannah said, you know, the demand for local meat is big. You know, people really do want it. And the problem is the price point. Um, so there's, I have no question that I could sell, I could sell probably two, three, four times more lamb um, that there's a market for. It, but, but again, it's at what price? Um, yeah. Um, that we that we can make that possible. But I think you know, in in theory, there's an enormous market. It's just that we can't we can't meet it at the right price at the moment. And and to do that. Of course, it's the slaughter, the cut and wrap, and in that part of it that makes it sort of unaffordable, or is it the growing in general that makes it unaffordable? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question and observation. I think there's two sides of it. One is kind of in the national scale, right? It's artificially cheap to raise enormous amounts of grain and pump it through animals uh, in feedlots. So if we had kind of a if we had a real approach to carbon and climate and things on a national level, you would see the price of conventional meat shoot up rapidly, um, which would indirectly help us because it would get us closer to the vegetable thing where you know it's going to be more expensive to raise stuff outside, but it's not going to be four times more. It might only be twice as, as much. So, so that would certainly help. And then, then on our expense side, of course, we have to try to be as efficient as we can. But the slaughter, you know, all of the logistics of slaughter are a huge um, issue. As I said, that can be like 30 to 40 percent of your expense can happen right there um, at the end. And, you know, maybe you know, I know there are grant programs. And as I said, I haven't quite committed to how what kind of a scale that we would be on um, in terms of how, you know, if we're going to build a if we're going to build a, a room, I want to make sure that, it's, that we're going to use it. You know, I don't want it to be just something that we, you know, twice a year go in there and and uh, you know slaughter a few animals. So, um, but one thing I would say, um, Hannah mentioned chickens as well. So, chickens, the USDA, you know, gives us some great flexibility under twenty thousand. And I think the legislature and the agency have done a good job of setting thresholds at one thousand and five thousand. And um, and as, as you sort of get bigger, the regulatory burden gets heavier, which I think is appropriate. Um, because you know you start to achieve some efficiencies and um, and you have a better sense of your business and but with chickens you can really start you know the first one there's very little regulation as you're learning about it um, and so it's a great way to get started um, vegetables is the same thing even with the food safety and modernization act you know that doesn't really kick in until half a million in in uh, in vegetable re in uh, in total revenue so um, Again, you have a chance to start at a smaller scale and kind of ease your way in, which is sort of a great kind of Vermont way of doing it. But if you're looking at red meat, it's like, you know, the, the full weight of the reg lands on you at animal number one. Um, so there's no, <laughs> there's no chance to tiptoe in there. Um, and especially when it comes to slaughter, um, <clears throat> that's, a big, uh, that's a big impediment. Yep. Any other questions for Chuck? Yes, if, if I guess there's no other questions, Chuck, and we want to, you know, thank you a lot for your time and, and appreciate your your work and your knowledge and sharing it with us. So um, stay in touch. Thanks, Senator, and, and uh, thanks to the to the committee for your interest in uh, in taking this testimony. I, I appreciated the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. So um, we have Joe Kevitt. Uh, good morning, Joe. <clears throat> good morning. Calling you from yes, talking in now today from sunny Columbus, Ohio. Oh, um, in a, long way uh, from home. Um, uh, yeah, it's one of those business meetings that you have to do with Farm Bureau every now and then. And, uh, um, you know, just just went through three days of really great uh, meetings on a lot of different subjects. Um, 
none of this on small farms though right now. A lot of diversity and and uh, pieces of helping us uh, grow as individuals, which was really good. Yeah. So um, as a small farm, so my name is Joe Tisbert. Uh, I am owner and operator of Valley Dream Farm in Cambridge, Vermont. I am also the state president of Vermont Farm Bureau. Um, it uh, as uh, gives me a unique perspective of how things I think of how things are and and where we have to stand as small farms, large farms, medium farms. We're all in this together. Uh, we need every one of us to create the markets. I think that a lot of uh, the question here was about, you know, how how do we help out uh, the diverse small diverse farms. Uh, on our farm, we grow, uh, we grow, we've grown a little hemp. Um, we've grown, uh, we grow mixed vegetables. We ship mostly wholesale. We do agritourism for farm to table dinners. Um, my daughter is coming back to the farm, has, has come back to the farm and she created a cut flower garden as her portion of the business. We also rent some land to a uh, young farm family, we rent five acres so they can increase their uh, vegetable production. And which I think is very key for us farmers that are um, young but older uh, to, to help out uh, some youngsters and, and keep uh, a vibrant Vermont farm, about Vermont farms. Um, well, I think it's very important that you know, we keep the regulation for these farms as low as we can. They already have a lot of, uh, you know, somebody just mentioned FISMAR and, you know, FISMAR, yeah, it doesn't kick in to a lot, till you have a lot of produce, but if you have to find a market out of state, then it kicks in much earlier. So, you know, finding the regulations, uh, grant funding that we can uh, you know, keep keep those guys in the ball in the ball game. I think is very important. Um, as I was thinking about this testimony, I I was thinking to myself, you know, there's so many bills going on now, um, kind of like the surface water bill that's out there. That you know, we cannot see. They cannot. We cannot as young as small farmers. We cannot compete in a world that we're going to have to pay for equipment. Uh, because we irrigate on such a small level of um, a small level of, of taking a 5,000 gallons out of, a, out of a river is nothing and it would take it doesn't take very much water to to get that out of the out of sight but what we would like to see is you know I mean I've talked with every state in New England um, on what their regulations are and how they're affected. And most of them, so a lot of them have that rule that, you know, you register and how much water you take, you, you um, report it. Um, some report it yearly, uh, some report it uh, more, uh, you know, monthly. But, um, you know, the thresholds are all over 50,000 gallons. Uh, so 50,000 to 100,000 gallons is the threshold. And as a small farm and having to buy equipment that would meter, um, that would meter water in, uh, intake you know, out of the, I'll take out of the rivers and then having to record it, you know, where's it going? Who's taking the, who taking the information? Is it a yearly thing that we're going to have to have to do? Uh, I think that's a very important piece that we, we have to think about when we're talking about small farms, how much regulation, how much burden are we putting on them? So there's lots of, you know, there's lots of issues out there. Um, you know, uh, fuel prices right now are through the roof. I just filled my, my oil tank for my greenhouse. We, we do some bedding plants in the spring here and we have uh, flowers and um, uh, bedding plants. We, we work really hard at trying to diversify our operation from early spring, late spring, summer, fall, uh, winter, and how we, how, we, how we make things work. Well, I'm gonna tell you at 499 a gallon for fuel, has just uh, taken something that we probably spend about $1,100 a year. And that one fill up was ended up over $2,000 for that fill up. Uh, small farms cannot afford 
and will not be in business very long if they have to keep this fuel cost uh, up. So this is a place that I don't know where we can help on this, um, but it's one thing that's really, really going to affect um, a lot of young, a lot of small, smaller and younger diverse farmers because they just, just to keep up, it just there's not enough uh, margins in their products in order to make in order to make it all all flow. Um, you know, so uh, lots of other things, uh, agritourism, um, to me, uh, it's kind of the glue that keeps our farm uh, together. Um, you know, it's like an insurance policy that, that helps us get through the summer when, when, when you don't ship, when you're shipping like we are, we're shipping mostly wholesale with some, uh, local sales in our farm stand, but, uh, the majority of our product will get shipped out um, to Deep Root Organic and, and get shipped all over the East Coast. Well, excuse me, it's all over the East Coast. So um, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, go ahead. Sorry. Schools, Joe? Do I ship to schools? Yes. No. Any any schools? No, we used to ship. Um, we used to ship to local wholesale in Burlington, City Market, Healthy Living, Food Hub, um, and Deep Root, and we used to do a CSA. And we've we have had to we've had to shift our business some um, because one is I'm I I, I took on Farm Bureau and. And that uh, takes some of my time away and traveling every day to Burlington or every three, every other day to Burlington is not conducive for really getting any work done around the farm. But, um, and we have done, uh, we've had done, we have sales at hospitals. We used to do a CSA in Northwest uh, Regional Health Center, um, which which was, you know, was borderline whether it had any success in it at all. Um, so that's why we, we, we've chose to go mostly wholesale uh, at this point um, for, you know, for, for, for family and, and, and life itself. You know, we just, uh, we needed to slow the pace of running 150 miles to deliver product uh, to get all your margins up. So, um, so one of the things that been out there that uh, some of the grants like Working Lands has done a really good job of helping folks get grants. The Department of Ag has helped folks get grants. I think stabilizing a grant process um, so that everybody has the availability of, of, of part participating um, and you don't, really, that you don't really need to be a big grant writer to get it. it so I'd like to see that, um, you know, the base of working land be high enough that folks who have an idea and have a business plan and can really show, you know, just need the little boost to help get this up and running, I think will be a really is really key uh, for the future, not for our future as a state in small agriculture, but also uh, viability of smaller farms, I think is real important. Uh, the agritourism piece, I know you guys are going to be looking at or you have looked at accessory on farm business. Um, you know, processing, uh, no matter what it is, processing uh, on the farm is very, would be a very key role uh, to help farms be more viable and regulation around processing would be uh, an important piece not to not to overinflate. I mean, uh, it's already expensive enough to try to get a processor uh, um, in, and we've looked at a processor to try to bring in for hemp. And I mean, the cost was ridiculous. It wasn't wasn't going to be feasible for us to do. But you know, so other folks may have, um, you know, may have a need to do that, and. And having funds available to help them get through that process and make it grow is it would be really key. Um, but the agritourism piece, I don't the accessory on farm business. I don't want to see a bill 
unintentionally hurt what we already have and what we already worked hard for with you guys to have an agritourism to make it even keel across the state. I'd hate to see, I'd hate to see it watered down or um, not enforced as it, as we already have it. I think we had a bill that was pretty strong. I'm not sure where accessories, where it would even take advantage. It seems like through the Department of Ag, if someone wanted to do cheese, they already have a process uh, in place that they can do it without um, too much uh, regulation in the way, Act 250. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I ask a question? Yes. Um, Joe, thanks for joining us and always good to see you. Um, you, you. You just, you fit in such an interesting way in the Ag puzzle in Vermont because of your own farm experience and of course um, you know having uh, being a, a critical voice for all farmers uh, uh, and our sort of history of of particularly dairy but then your own experience is so different so I, I'm always intrigued by your comments listening to all the farmers today and you I, I, I'm struck by the enormous amount of hurdles that that go from hey, what do you think about growing, you know, vegetables and and small scale meat production? Could we do it? You know, then you got to find some land, and then you got to find find markets and distribution, and and the business, the hurdles to set that business up are frankly staggering. But then you layer on top of that the various details of regulation. And um, I, I guess two questions. Do you hear from people that that does them in or that wards them away? And the, the regulation piece on top of all those other hurdles? And <clears throat> is there any entity that really helps as a one-stop shop? Like, like if somebody has land, they've got some knowledge, or access to land, get the knowledge and the marketing down. Is there someone to call and check in and say, you know, here's what I want to do X, Y, and Z. What are the rules? Do we, do we have good systems in place to make that as easy as possible? I'm not sure I have a, uh, an expertise that there is, there is places to call. There's extension, you know, like, um, you know, Heather Darby up in St. Albans does an amazing job of, of answering questions and trying to get it. I don't think there, there's one. I know you can call the Department of Ag and get some answers. Um, and I know that at Farm Bureau, I don't know if we do a good enough job of saying, you know, all the, here's the one shop and yes, you're doing things, this is great. Uh, one of the things that we try to push as Farm Bureau is mentoring, um, <laughs> trying, to, trying to help folks under, you know, we're gonna tie you in with somebody that, you know, can help you. And that's what we do. But, um, you know, the tasks are, uh, you know, you have to be a really, you have to try to be a good businessman, even though farming is about passion, right? It's, it's uh, you know, if you don't have a passion for it, you're not going to do it. And, um, you know, uh, so I don't think I have a good answer for you, uh, Senator Pearson, but um, I, I think that would be a helpful piece um, if there was that uh, perfect liaison and maybe they're out there I just uh, and I'm you know a little older and a little more stubborn to ask for help but um, you know we just uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure I have the right answer for you. Well I, I like that about you and and you know there are different pieces of it right we have the business right. uh, uh, planning out of VHCB and, and, and technical support you know but but um, to the extent that this is squarely in the future for Vermont agriculture, it seems to me that's something we could look into. Um, so I, uh, I'll put that on our own list, uh, but thank you. I appreciate your thinking. So I was also, I was also thinking about working lands. I mean, you know, um, I think that there's talk about raising the yearly uh, minimum. And I think that that's a great idea um, to raise it so that you know, the funds are there if the people have these progress. And I don't, I think from what I've learned is that, you know, they've never run out of money. They've always run out of money 
before they run out of things they could fund. And I know that through adjustments and everything, a lot of times things get funded, but having a yearly base that's, uh, you know, can be counted on um, also to relieve some of the restrictions on those funds. Like we've heard of farms this year that, um, excuse me, have, um, you know, getting product is tight, getting help is tight, couldn't get a project done that was even though it was ready to go, you know, their funds were going to run out at a certain time. And to be able to extend those funds, um, I think is an, would be an important change to how the working lands all works. So extend it out over, you know, if you do get the funds, give you an adequate time, especially with uh, conditions the way they are today with, um, supplies being tight, labor being tight, um, expense, the expense, you know, a project that was signed up in 20 or 21. Now the cost of that project has more than doubled um, just for supplies itself. So I think that, you know, we should be sensitive to that. And I think, you know, we'd like to see that uh, go further. Yeah, Hanner, we had Hanner Doyle on earlier today. I think it, she and her, her farm's down uh, toward uh, Fairfax, I think, Fletcher from, from New Job. But she said if there was a, a diagram set up so that if, if you were wanting to do veggies, uh, vegetable growers, and if you needed advice, the line would go to a person that could help you, say, with fertilizer, could go with, uh, down further to uh, an agronomist who could help you with soil types. And, and so if we had a little roadmap for different uh, products that um, it would be most helpful rather than getting on the phone, uh, calling USDA, calling the extension, calling the ag agency, and hoping that the person that says hello can direct you in the right direction. So in, instead of spending a lot of time chasing phone numbers, uh, there would be sort of a, a little system set up where whoever answers the phone would have that readily available um, would be most helpful in like her case. Um, I don't know if there is such a thing as that and we've missed it or not. So I don't think there is such a thing. And, you know, that might be one of the things that, you know, somebody gets a grant for to set up so that it's, it's out there for the state and, and the state can work on it. And I mean, the thing is, you got a lot of folks doing a lot of things right now. And, and you know, a lot of what their time, like extensions time is earmarked to certain events, right? Because, you know, they got to get that soft money so that they can do it. The water quality, the, you know, the specialty crops has, has been doing a really good job. But I, I think that that may be a great way to go and could be somebody's project that, um, and also getting, putting people on, you know, connecting people to people, right? It's uh, the Veg and Berry Growers does a good job of that. They have uh, put pieces out there. You know, another thing that's hurting small farms is labor. Um, I know nationally, I'm working really diligently uh, to try to help this H2A program make adjustments that can help small and smaller farms that need help with labor and housing is a problem. You know, there's some folks out there trying to help with that. But, uh, you know, a lot of the smaller farms may need to put people in their own home and the repair might need to be to their own home in order to house their workers. That's something that we do. Um, but when you look at the grant for, you know, housing repairs or expansion to make it all done, and if it's your own home, you can't use it. I mean, that's really a, that's really a, a drawback, especially to smaller farms. Uh, who may not have two houses on their farm and, and be able to set one up for, for housing for uh, H-2A labor, immigrant labor. It's, it's, a big, it's a big issue. It's becoming bigger because one person can do one 
can do a little bit of work and uh, maybe make some money, but if they want to be successful, they may have to have a person or two to work with them uh, so that they can do all the business pieces that need to be done and not just all the labor that needs to be done. So it's very important to, we, we look at the whole picture. So Joe, that, that housing program that uh, we set up last year, the year before, but just, it just got going this winter through yep. Champlain Housing, you can't get any assistance if if the farmer hand lives in the farmhouse itself. You can't get any assistance to correct to that. That that's one of the things that would kill your your loan. I mean oh. the, the the you know because you can get thirty thousand dollars to help with. You know, making, you know, maybe you want to expand that place so they have an extra, so they have two, they each have their own room or something that's in your house. And, you know, you, you, you may be living with the farmer uh, full time and they, and you may need space. And so that is, that is definitely one of the pieces that says uh, you don't qualify for the, for the grant money. I'll be damned. See, we... <laughs> You know, we try to do things perfect, but I guess we missed that one for sure. <laughs> uh, well, we had, I guess no one had brought that mm. to our attention and never thought of it. So, so uh, it's good to, yeah, I had no idea no. that that wouldn't work. <laughs> um, hey, uh, on the... Um, surface water bill we're going to be taking that up uh joe 466 yes. and the way the way that's supposedly set up right now uh is if you take it on 30 day in intervals and you can do fifty thousand gallons a day through the 30 days, but if you go over the 50,000, then you, you get boosted into a different category. Um, and if you, uh, so I guess at the end of the year, you would have to make a report on if you went over your, see, 50, uh, five, yeah, 50,000 gallons a day for 30 days, but if you had four days in there that you never, you know, you didn't use any, you average out your gallonage uh, for the month, and as long as you didn't go over uh, the 50,000 a day, you would you wouldn't have to do much. Does that make any sense? Um, you know, as a smaller farmer, that makes sense that the threshold is up. Um, is, is Did we put any, I mean, because, you know, you're talking about 50,000 a day. What do vegetables need? Vegetables need an inch of, approximately most vegetables will take an inch of rain a week in order to be successful. So, if, if that's the case and you have, you know, an inch of rain today or a half inch of rain today, you don't need to irrigate as much as you would have done before. So that, that piece probably would work. Um, I just uh, totally, uh, I spoke with some of the advocates for this bill. Um, I really feel like it's a, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist here. I have, I don't feel like, I don't feel like um, it's one of those things that um, when they told me, well, we comparing this to certain other places in the country, when I research those other places, we get 23% more rain than those other places. Um, so is this, is this, again, it's a regulation for us, for farmers to do. And is it, is it, is it something that we really need or is it something waiting for waiting for a problem? 
And, and I'm sorry to say this, I, I'm willing to work hard at, you know, if this was a real problem, then farm should do it and do it well. But I mean, I've heard prices up which of two to five, thousand dollars a meter and i know some farms that have four or five different pumps and in order to have a meter they don't use them all the same time they may use this one today and that one two days from now and another one down the road you know i mean and you got to set up all those pumps at you know ten to twenty thousand dollars with meters to to make it go where it's going and where is it going to go from here you know who's going to monitor what what department is going to monitor who's you, the water usage? Is it going to go to the Department of Ag and who there is going to do it? Is there going to be, is there going to be some kind of fine or, or you know, are we going to build in some kind of fine in the near future that says, oh yeah, you use fifty-one thousand gallons um, a, a day for a month this summer? Uh, now we're gonna we're gonna kick you to another category. We got more stringent regulation you're going to get fined because you were over that limit i mean i i just see so many rabbit holes in this whole bill that you know if it was a problem let's do it but is it a problem here and and yes we've had last year when you look at the drought figures uh, the bottom third of the state got way more rain than they have than they have in the past. The middle part of the state was almost right, and the upper part, upper northeast kingdom was very dry. So you know we're all over the place, right? Uh, yeah. And I just don't. I in my if we could not have this bill, it would be it would be great with me. But if we need this bill, fifty thousand gallons is a way better place to be. Uh, I just want to know where, where's it going to go? Are there going to be fines? What, you know, what's, uh, what is the, uh, what is the really, uh, why do we really need this? I guess is my real question. Next, uh, next Tuesday. Um, well, hopefully they're supposed to get that bill out between now and Monday out of natural resources. And we're going to have it, um, either in here Tuesday or Wednesday. And so I don't know if you'll be back uh, in Vermont, Joe, but if you or Jackie or somebody from Prime Bureau uh, wants to uh, be in on, on that discussion, we'd be glad to uh, have you, we invite you. I would, I am back. I'm. I'm leaving here at two o'clock to come to come home, and I am. I'll just look a quick look at my calendar. I can meet on Tuesday or Wednesday. I would be happy to be on. Um, I think this is very important, uh, especially for our veg and berry growers, small farmers. I don't think this hits a lot of the. I don't think if somebody wanted this to hit the larger farms, I don't think it does. I'm minimally, if it does. Um, when you look across our state, we don't have a lot of pivot irrigation systems like I've seen out here in uh, in Iowa or in other places um, in the South, especially Alabama and Mississippi, where I've been, and and you and they can't grow anything without that irrigation. You know, we're not we're not in that ball game, but in order to be successful, we have to we have to irrigate. No, we're very fortunate uh, on our climate, actually. Uh, for the most part, uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Um, are there other questions for uh, Joe? Uh, I was thinking, uh, Joe, do you have a, um, did you apply for, did you receive a wash station, a veggie washing station grant, or do you have one that you you use to wash your veggies before they go? We we um, had a grant, um, I, I'm eight, eight or nine years ago to build a washroom in our barn. Uh, we we have an old dairy barn and we converted a piece of it to a washroom and a cooler in order to do that. And we got some grant help to form the room uh, that we're working in, that we wash in uh, potatoes and beets and stuff during the winter. Yeah, so that's working. 
See, some of the newer ones, I don't know if they, newer farmers didn't know we have, that grant supposedly still still good and, and going, um, but, um, you know. Very, imp the, very important. Yeah, very important. And, and of course, somebody said this morning that they applied and, and they were told there was no money left in that fund uh, to do that. Well, that was the first I'd heard of it. And uh, so we, we've got to check on that to make sure there is uh, money in that, um, in that uh, fund for grants uh, for that purpose. Um, That'd be great. So, uh, well, if there, if there are no other questions, I guess uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, for your time, Joe, and have a safe trip back and uh, keep us in mind for uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday. I will be watching if uh, then I will definitely, I'll definitely get on. Uh, definitely be great. Hey, I appreciate yeah. your time. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, I, I hope you're all successful in, uh, during the summer here and going forward. And, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Well, very good. Thanks again, Joe. Do we have any others on? We do not. That is the extent of the witnesses. For this well, so, well, that, uh, so that wraps up our, our witnesses, um, Got some good uh, feedback. Yeah. yeah, that was um, interesting and and good. Um, yeah, Bobby, I, I just want to say thanks. That 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 I that was way more interesting and and useful than even I'd hoped. And I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, that um, I thought it went very well and and got a few ideas on things that we might be able to do to. Uh, you know, that give these guys a hand uh, for future, um, for future. Uh, it's amazing, you know, hearing from somebody that's only been at it a year or two to yeah. somebody like Joe that's been at it a long time. And, and uh, another one was uh, been doing it for 20 odd years and uh, seems like, you know, they run, um, they have an idea and and just go for it, and they're kind of on their own doing their own their own thing. And you know, the guy that that bought the old farm on Route Twelve, mm -hmm. I think he said Twelve, uh, that had no really no topsoil; it all been dormant, and now he's got six or eight inches of uh, you know good soil. So, and they seem to really be tuned in like that guy said well hell i've got six or eight inches of topsoil and for every inch it'll hold x number of gallons of water and yeah. and uh you know so they they've done pretty well at it that the meat issue though the, keeps, yeah, i'm just going to say that every single one of them mentioned that to some degree the, yeah, the I mean, uh Montpelier's, the city of Montpelier's flood insurance should send that guy a check every yeah, year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's he's just in the wrong direction now. He should have been back up toward uh, East Montpelier and up in there instead of down on Route Twelve. <laughs> um, no, that damn meat thing though, you know, to have to take a lamb. We are still on and raise it to be a sheep and then get it big enough so you can sell it for a quarter bucks and you end up with $50. Yeah. I mean, the guy that grows that little plot of uh, cannabis, you know, that plants it in the spring and sells it in the fall or whenever, I mean, golly. But it, it's hard to believe that that's all that would be left and and uh is 50 50 bucks it sounds like trucking yeah 
You work all day trucking, and if you end up with 50 bucks at the end of the day, you've done well. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I think we're all set. Uh, anything else? Uh, no, I, uh, I'm glad uh, Joe raised the concerns on the water, although I have yeah, a lot of concerns yeah. with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, that uh, I met with Chris again this morning. He will we, will give... we have possession or just fly by? No, it's not going to fly. Okay. I mean, it may fly in. Uh, no, I, but I told him we'd probably, uh, you know, needed a day or two to get testimony, you know, from people of concern. And uh, the... Uh, he died he, earlier, he thought he'd get it out yesterday. Today, he said, maybe tomorrow, but if not tomorrow, for sure on Monday, so. He's bringing his crew into work on Mondays? Oh yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah, oh. they worked last Monday. You remember, don't you? I do, so I don't miss it. You're gonna be back there if you don't well, shape up. I won't show up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, hopefully, uh, so hopefully, uh, you know, we can get some people lined up once we yeah. all win. And uh, we'll, uh, but any, you know, if you think about today's meeting, uh, jot any of those ideas down that, uh, that were suggested where we might be able to help. I like your idea of that sort of schematic, or I don't know what you want to call it, but. Yeah. Okay, I'm interested in this. Here's who I call or email or visit. Yeah. It, it seems like that wouldn't be that difficult to put together. I don't think so. Either. And uh, and just have it at whoever answers the phone. Yep. You know, have it uh, have it there, and that would be uh, most uh, most helpful. Well, if there isn't anything else, uh, we'll, uh, we'll call it a morning and, uh, and adjourn. And tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Ryan Patch coming in, uh, the first thing in regards to the uh, uh, ecosystems and, yep. and all that. And uh, so we'll, we'll have him in and and see how that goes and how it's been going and uh, go from there. Okay.